joining the army is not just a job but rather a way of life you are taken from civilian streets and trained to operate in adios conditions within some of the most dangerous places on earth but no one stays in the army forever this is where the transition back to civilian can be tricky and to some people very challenging in this series i speak to men and women who's been there and done it i find out how they managed to successfully transition back to civilian life and what they would have done differently it is my hope that this video provides some valuable tips for serving personnel looking to successfully transition back into civilian life. This is their story. My name is Dr. Emmanuel Nati. Um, I used to serve in the British Army. I'm also an Olympian. Now I am a senior law lecturer and a researcher. Well, I could say that I was born in a poverty environment in Ghana and uh, um, it was very difficult for my um, family to feed us. And so if you ask me whether I see myself to become a soldier, I will probably answer it's an illusion. I never saw myself to become a soldier um, um, when I was in Ghana. And, um, but I did have a belief that one day I'll be successful. I believe in life that um, we all um, here for certain purpose and this purpose is driven by um, your inner guiding opportunity that is present to you and through the sport opened the door for me joining the British Army because I had an opportunity to come to Manchester for the Commonwealth Games and then I met some British soldiers and some RAF soldiers who also volunteered working for the Games and through conversation with them about sports, about judo, about career, that really um, resonated with me and that attracted me to join the British Army really. So that is where the thinking of becoming a soldier began to appear. Um, when I came back to the UK, the process was, for me was quite straightforward. If, if um, I look back, um, I just went to the selection centre and um, it was quite funny. They asked me, what do you want to do? I told them I want to be John Rambo. <laughs> That's what happened when you are 18 years old um, um, child. But um, I think it was straightforward. I was given the BAP test to revise and then I went to my interview and they, found, they actually found me fascinating even though I was a little bit shy. But um, they thought I have um, the attribute. So they did push my um, recruitment quite quite fast I would say because I started the process and two months later I was in the selection center. It was a shock in the system, to the system but the second part is that I found a determination within me that I thought I never had because when I walked through the door I knew that at that time regardless of how long I served in the army my civilian life was over and I need to be bound by institutional policy uh, and, and those things. But I also determined to be successful in everything that I do. So when I walked through the door, I, was, I just said, I remember I said to myself, well, this is it. You know, this is the basic training and you have to give it um, your best shot. To be honest, I found the shouting and, and, and all those screaming on the recruit, I just found it. Hilarious. I think it's nonsense, really. <laughs> Sorry, because I always, I always laugh at them, and and some of the time the sergeant wanted to punish me because they think um, I don't take things seriously. But I think it's because I have my human nature. I saw that um, this is rather funny, rather than anything that intimidates me. I found it easy. Um, I think it's the the weapon handling test was a little bit difficult because my, um, I would say my mind was not programmed in, in that way so it was really difficult to get the hang of it. Also I did struggle a little bit with the drill as well and uh, partly might be because the different accents that um, the instructor used to, to um, speak with us that's what I did struggle with but in terms of the actual training the physical aspect I did really enjoy it I did really enjoy the exercise the tabbing and also um, I enjoyed the running I, I, I remember I my first mile and half run was 
eight minutes when I was in basic training. So it was, it was quite, I, I did enjoy it. They did give me one week off as well when I lost my father, but they didn't, um, we call it back squad or however, if they've changed the name. Yeah, they didn't back squad me. They, they allowed me to pass out on the 30th with um, the other recruit or my original peers because they, they just thought um, I'm at the level that I could pass without um, them sending me back to do everything again. I wouldn't say my experience in the field army was, was great, but looking back, I think I needed that experience because that experience is what motivated me to go and do sports rather than to stay in the tank park and clean the tanks with the soldiers. I love my basic training because I felt I was supported, I was looked after, I felt the, the training staff were very good, you know. But having said that, I um, like for example, Koko Guerin, he was like a fantastic um, NCO, he was right, um, very supportive from the beginning. And Major Leslie, who is the commanding officer, and, and if it's not Major Leslie, I probably wouldn't have achieved everything. Yes, I did compete in the Olympics um, in London 2012. Um, I competed for Ghana because I wanted to inspire um, the young generation in Ghana. And I also knew competing for the UK might be good, but there's hundreds or hundreds of Olympians in the UK and there is only a couple in Ghana. So if I compete from Ghana, for Ghana, I'll be able to inspire the future generation. I will also be able to expose Ghana judo to the international level and that they will also gain much support. And doing that as well, I will also be able to show the diverse side of the British Army that you don't need to be British citizen, compete for Britain in order for someone to support you to go to the Olympics. I made the decision to leave in summer 2019. The first part is I felt disrespected by um, the current um, CEO at that time. And the second part is I felt that um, I have outgrown the army as well. And um, in life, when you outgrow something, <laughs> then you, you know that it's time to go. Um, I didn't like what the way Things happen when the um, uh, CEO came in and, and, and a lot of things that he was trying to do didn't sit well with me. And um, I, I know that they, I, I, he, he was an OC before and we've met before and I, I think there is um, there's a rationale or a history behind that behavior. And it got to a point that I said to um, the Army Sports Control Board and the Army Team Manager who was fighting for me to stay in the army because of the good thing that I have been doing. But um, I felt at that time, I do not need it anymore. And I do not need um, certain people to say certain things to me anymore. And I have outgrown that. And when I left, that was the time I realized that it was an individual personality rather than the regiment because my leaving, the people below were very, very supportive, very, very accommodating, and, and the transition was quite very smooth. So after a sign, I got it that it's actually the CEO personality rather than the unit wanted me to do this. I think it's, it's an individual personality. And for me, it's the best decision because um, I think sometimes we need to do the right thing in life and I don't think using personality is the right way to do things in life. I knew what I, um, I wanted to do and I knew the direction of my life even when I was serving as a soldier and, and so my transition was not a problem at all because I had a job six months before. I left the army and um, I didn't engage in any of the resettlement when I was, when I was even trans transitioning from the army. I think it's because I had my PhD but also because I know what I wanted to do and I don't feel like I need the army support to do anything. I feel like um, 
I'm better being on my own and I do not want any restriction on me because um, certain things that I would advise people not to do is the first thing you need to do is you need to take ownership and in charge of your life when you are leaving the army because this is very very important and I understand that so I wanted to have the full control of that ownership and I think also sometimes in life you have to read between the line and read the sign. So when I saw the way the CEO behaved, I decided I have to take ownership and control over this transition without any interference. And that made my process rise smoothly because I don't need to go to CV write, writing session. I don't need to go to a skill session, you know. For, for me in particular, I think it was a waste of my time. My time should be focused more on my future career and how am I going to structure and develop my current skills to meet what the employers need outside. So this is what I was focusing on. Um, what I wanted people shouldn't do is when you get institution involved too much, it takes too much of your time. It takes too much of your thinking because they try to think for you. And it is your life. They shouldn't be thinking for you. You should be thinking for them. You should be telling them, this is what I believe is my path and this is what I have to do. So they should present you with a lot of puzzles and you pick the one that you wanted to solve. And I was very good at that. So when I went to Warminster at the education center, they present me with this. I just told them straight away, I do not need all those things. And I told them, I'm sorry, sitting here is a waste of my time. So I better go and focus on what I wanted to do. So within two months, I told them I have a job and I'm better staying in my job and focusing on that job rather than um, coming here to do this, to do that. Because I found like sometimes people focus more on the tick box exercises rather than what they need to do. So my advice would be focus more on the things you need to do and the future ahead of you because they tick box exercise is what land you into trouble when you, when you decide to leave. It's a mixture of, uh, of, of, of emotion because um, the first part is 17 and a half years of your life dedicated to um, army sports and seven sports in, in, in the regiment. And then you, you just, everything is just finished. You know, you're looking at what next and you kind of think, wow, where did the 17 and a half years gone? And, and the other side of me was very exciting that I do not have to be accountable to anyone and what I do, you know. So having the freedom and the ownership of my life giving me the excited moment and it compensates um, what um, uh, I missed. And most important also, the really, really close um, individuals who have helped me are still part of my life. So. I wouldn't say there's something that I have I have missed in, in terms of, of living, but more, I just think that um, if they are able to build on what I, I left behind, then there might be an, some more excitement when I see in future how far the Army Judo have come. But this is up to them to, 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 to figure it out and the next generation, what they do from there. After my PhD, I begin to apply for a lot of lecturer roles. Um, had a few interviews. I wasn't successful, and you will know, coming from non-privileged background, is always always difficult. You have to work hundred times um, um, than other people. But I think I was very determined. Determined determination making me a successful person. So I end up having a job in Cardiff, and. Um, from there, I decided to work and improve on my uh, writing skills. So I got a um, contract with Cambridge Press to complete two books, um, volume one and volume two in corporate accountability. And this one is actually, will officially be out next week and it's um, corporate accountability um, in human rights violations. So basically I use tort law and international law to explain to the judiciary or the judges, how they could bypass the notion of corporate legal personality under international law and use tort law 
to enforce human rights against multinational corporations who violate human rights in developing countries. The successful spirit is um, about 32 authors. We came together to write the book and the person who invited me to write this book is from the state. And he called me and asked me if I would be able to write a chapter in this book. And the focus is to inspire others and, and help them to understand, not to educate them, help them to understand that they are, they are their own sources, basically. My final advice for individuals who wanted to leave the army or who are scared of the civilian life is, I think you do not be scared because you do not know how greater you are until you expose yourself to um, the challenges in life. And um, you need to have an ownership of your life and your achievement because um, no one knows you better than yourself. So know thyself, really. When you know thyself, you know that um, your capability and, and also you know your attribute and all those achievements, all those attributes, all those things are within you. It's not down to the institution, but you have to demonstrate this to other people that this is what you can do. So fear shouldn't be a factor and, and, and um, not knowing shouldn't be a factor, but mostly be courageous and be ambitious in your decision and make that bold step to greater success rather than the um, fear factors of, of, of not knowing that I will succeed or not because you need to fall in order to succeed otherwise you will never know how greater you are.